All right, so this is Art 131 with Wyndham Graves, and I have Margaret Lynn here, um, the curator for the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts. And actually, I'll let you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and what a curator does in a museum. Okay, well, good morning, Wyndham, and good morning, anybody who chooses to listen in with us eventually. Um, my name is Margaret Lynn, and I am the senior curator at the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts. I've worked there for more than 30 years. Uh, that's kind of a long time in curator livelihood. A lot of times museum curators tend to move around to different museums uh, and progress in their job fields as they, as they go along in their career. I'm kind of unique in that I was uh, born, I was bo actually born in Texas, but I was raised in Montgomery. Um, and I volunteered at the museum when I was in high school and in college. And um, as I got my education, I went to uh, the University of Alabama, uh, got a degree in history with a minor in art history, and then went to George Washington University in Washington, D.C which at the time that I went there for my master's degree was really one of only um, about three universities in the country that had master's degrees programs in museum studies, which is uh, what I got my master's degree in with a concentration in art history. Now those programs are, are kind of widespread. There are there actually are many of them in the southeast. Let me, let me stop the, you there. Um, what yeah. would be the difference for, for students between a museum studies and an art history degree? Um, the museum studies degrees, well, first of all, you would, I, I don't know of any programs that offer undergraduate museum studies degrees. Those are usually uh, museum studies degrees are advanced degrees. You can get an undergraduate degree, obviously, in art history. You can also get, uh, and it depends upon the school, um, there are many schools that offer art history degrees with, um, with certificates in museum studies now. And the difference between those two programs is simply that they add in the curriculum uh, courses that allow you to get some knowledge of uh, how a not-for-profit organization works, uh, how to work with a board, how to work with um, uh, people in the other, other people in the nonprofit sector, uh, fundraising, uh, all the different kinds of jobs that go into basically supporting a not-for-profit that's related to art. Okay, um, that's and, cool. And you kind of think, well, why would a curator need to know that? Well, you, as a curator, you really do need to know how what it is you're doing or want to do is going to be supported and what is financially feasible. Uh, how much money it takes to do something is very important to know mm -hmm. so that you can then communicate that to the people that are trying to help you do your program. So that's important. The other kind of central area that's covered in museum studies as opposed to art history is the actual physical care of objects. And, and by that I don't mean necessarily that curators uh, physically care for them uh, very rarely do we, but we have to know what the environmental requirements are for the care of art, who can care for an object. Those people are called conservators. We have to know what, how to talk to a conservator about what the object was historically, what's wrong with it, uh, and then we have to collaborate on figuring out how to either restore it, repair it, or preserve it. So those are kind of, of a few of the areas that are covered in museum studies that are that are not really covered in art history. Okay, Someone great. who got a, an advanced degree in art history is really solely is probably looking to be uh, a, a, an academic, a, a teacher on the university level usually. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, so yes, yeah, so you went to school for that, and then you came back to the museum to be the curator. Actually, um, I before I did that, I became a curator of education, um, and that was an interesting job for me because while I I love to study, I like to read, I, I like all of the elements that go into learning and, and to a certain extent teaching, um, I found that uh, it was I was more interested in 
physically caring for the, and physically being involved with the objects, working with them, as opposed to the, the central focus being teaching about them. Um, and I, as a curator of education, I basically developed programs for um, middle school students mm -hmm. and worked with volunteers to deliver those. Um, that was not here in Montgomery, that was up in Huntsville, Alabama, and for a little while up in Washington, D.C. So um, I had that position, uh, and I tell people that one of the things that brought me back to being uh, a curator of, of objects, painting, sculpture, that kind of work, was that while I, I like people a lot, I didn't want to necessarily work with them all the time as volunteers. That's so great. when I had the option to return to being an objects-based curator, which was offered to me actually when I was home uh, visiting uh, my family one summer, uh, I was offered the option to come back to work in Montgomery as an assistant curator, and I did that and uh, have stayed, primarily because I, as if, if, you, if you, I know you know, I think you know, and probably a lot of your stu students are familiar with the fact that the museum in Montgomery has been in Montgomery since the 1930s. Um, and I went to work in at the, here in Montgomery as a curator, a professional curator, in the uh, mid-1980s. So the institution itself has changed dramatically over time. We built a new museum. Yeah, I was, just gonna, um, I was just going to ask you about that. Um, yeah, the museum back in the 80s was downtown, and that was downtown yes. since the 30s? Um, yeah, yes, it was, in okay. two different buildings, yeah. So I worked at the museum downtown, uh, first as a volunteer in high school, and then uh, as an intern in college. And then when I came back to work for the museum, um, I, when I came back, the museum was still down in, uh, in what is now the uh, Julia Morgan Library downtown. Okay. The museum was located in that building. So I uh, moved with the museum to the Blount Cultural Park in 1989. And so in, in a lot of ways, my position at the museum um, changed from really being an intern assistant to being one of, of several curators. And then eventually over time, be beginning to build more capacity with our collection and adding um, a lot more information about the collection, uh, migrating a lot of the information that we have about the collection online, uh -huh. um, and then doing a lot of other elements to hopefully pull the museum further into the 21st century in terms of how we're interpreting our work. Okay, cool. Um, and you said that you were one of, of a few curators. Uh, is, how is that split up among... How do you guys decide who gets to do what? Well, it's kind of a joke at the museum right now. We have two primary objects curators, and I'm one of them. And the other is Jennifer uh, Jankowskis, who is uh, a curator who focuses more on modern and contemporary art. Uh, we have kind of a running joke at the museum that I'm the curator of dead artists. And she's the curator of the live ones. I think I've heard that. Um, and and we uh, we sort of that's the way we tend to divide our responsibilities right now at the museum. We've done it differently in the past. We've had uh, curators who were solely focused upon uh, exhibitions, planning, curating exhibitions, putting those together, doing research, do, doing project-based work. Versus someone like me, I've, I've basically always been in the position of being a collections curator, which means that I focus more of my work on works that are part of the museum's permanent collection. That's, that's not atypical, at the same in some museums, but in many museums, especially the larger ones that your students or listeners may be familiar with, like the Metropolitan, um, curators are subject-based uh, or period-based. That's to say, at the Met, they would have a curator of 18th century uh, European painting. Uh -huh. um, and actually, at the Met, they would break it down further than that. It would be a curator who would have responsible for a, a responsibility for 18th century French painting. But Jeez. getting that kind of specialization is very rare. Yeah, I mean, it, it's only that only takes place in uh, rel relatively massive uh, collecting institutions like the Metropolitan or the Louvre or the British Museum. So in, in our situation, we're sort of in the middle. We have, 
we divide up our responsibility in terms of function, but we're not such an, an enormous collection that we can't um, utilize a, a lot of other people's input. Um, we, we actually have, for example, in our collection, a small group of African, traditional African art objects. Um, I don't see myself as the curator of that specific work. I'm curator of the collection that owns it. But when we need scholarship or we need uh, information or expertise, uh, there's an academic who teaches or did teach down at the University of Florida in Gainesville who we contract with to provide that expertise for us. Oh, that's so interesting. We can have, yeah, we can have things in the collection that, that don't necessarily, we have subject expertise on our staff, but we commission it or contract for it when we need that. We've, we've done that kind of consistently with our old master print collection. We did a show um, probably about eight years ago that uh, that was curated uh, and the prints were documented, uh, cataloged by uh, Susan Dackerman, who is a, a scholar at the University of uh, Massachusetts. And we basically contracted with her to provide curatorial service for us for that specific project. So that tends to happen consistently as we acquire work where we need that expertise, as we did with the African, then we organize bringing in the expertise rather than hiring another curator that is specific to that knowledge base. That makes sense, especially if it's a small portion of an over of a overarching collection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, on that note, there are shows in, that are shows that come in that are traveling shows, I believe, that are not organized by the two of you. Um, yep. How how does how does your job interact with uh, I guess somebody else's curation? Is that how you'd yeah. say it? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Wow, that's that's a whole. Um, like, does that depend on like per show, or is there kind of a consistent well, role that you take when those things come in, or is it just kind of well by the, city the, of the, ec the, the whole ecosystem of. <laughs> of what we call temporary shows or traveling shows, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. contracted shows. Those are the shows that basically the museum contracts to bring to the museum for a specific amount of time, mm -hmm. show in the museum, and then the, that show leaves. And yes, correctly, it is curated by someone other than someone on our staff. And what we do when we, we contract for it, we're basically contracting for having the work at the museum and for the scholarship that goes into preparing the work for uh, to be exhibited at the museum, uh, and the we, we pay for uh, a, at least a prorated amount of the, the cost of mounting the exhibition and shipping it and, and doing everything that's required to take it from one museum to another museum and show it in different places. So we all sort of, by contracting for this, we all sort of collaborate. But okay, so it's general, kind of a package deal of all of the parts it, that, that go into making it, a show. That's exactly right. It is a package deal. So when we get the package, let's just say that from the standpoint of uh, scheduling, there's a, a show that's coming. It's a packaged show or contracted show. Uh, one of the curators at the museum, either me or Jennifer, takes on the responsibility for being the in-house organizer uh, and, and manager of the show. So in mm -hmm. that situation, we're really functioning more as managers than we are as curators. Okay. Um, we, we may do some level of different kind of research to contextualize what's in that show. Um, and by contextualizing for, what's in that show, you just mean uh, making it available for people who are actually coming to our museum, right? To the well, Montgomery correct. Museum. Correct, yeah. Right, and, and doing that involves also, is a, a large portion of that is offering that contextualization, all that information to our um, our docents that we train to give tours for the public. And docents uh, and are it, just uh, volunteers that give tours? What's the definition of a docent there? Mm -hmm. Yep. Docent is basically a, a volunteer tour guide. Okay. Uh, that's the case in most every museum, uh, that the people who give the tours... Uh, primarily they're volunteers, not necessarily, but they usually are, uh, and they're called docents. Okay. So we, when we are managing a temporary exhibition we didn't organize, 
a lot of times we, we educate ourselves about the content and the context for that content so that we can then get past that along to our, our education, our educators and specifically our volunteer docents. Awesome. So that's a, that's a big role of what we do. Um, for, I'm just trying to think of an example of a traveling show. I, I did um, uh, an exhibition of um, when we opened the new museum in the Blunt Cultural Park. I borrowed, it, it was a kind of a hybrid thing. I borrowed works of art from museums in the Southeast that had been given by those museums' primary donors to their collections. So in the case of the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts, that would be the Blunt Collection? Yeah, correct. And, okay. that's, and that's the reason I did it, because when we opened the museum in the park, Mr. Blunt, who was the head of Blunt Incorporated, and it had a corporate collection, basically at that point gifted to the museum the works uh, in the corporate collection that he intended to, to gift the museum's collection. And so in a, in a sense to honor his gift, um, we did a show, it was called The Grand Tour, it's really mm -hmm. pretty cool, cool. Um, where we borrowed a work of art or works of art from other museums in the Southeast that had been given by their primary donors. So you can imagine it was a, it was a really an interesting uh, conglomeration of I was about to say, that sounds work. like it would be a rather uh, eclectic mix of things. It was, it, it, it was. We had everything from 18th century British art. We actually got loans from the National Gallery up in Washington of a couple of paintings that had given by, been given by Paul Mellon. And then, uh, every, and then we got a loan from uh, the museum down in Orlando, Florida of... Um, Oh, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the artist right now, but uh, a very contemporary art brute um, artist painter uh -huh. from France. Um, so, and then everything in between. Um, so it was it was really a fascinating show. But in talking about curating that, basically I was using the scholarship that had been already well filled and created by the curators of those museums to put together this collection. And then I had to try to contextualize that for the audience in Montgomery to kind of explain, you know, why was all this work together? And the, the reason, of course, was the, to talk about the importance of philanthropy to art museums. Okay. Um, and that's how art museums get the material that we have largely is, is through philanthropy. Well, that's really so cool. it was, it was, it, yeah, it was an interesting project and it was in some ways it was really a joy to do that because I learned not only a lot about artists that I was not necessarily as familiar with, but also about the collections of these museums. So it was really great. That was cool. Um, and just to be clear to most uh, people in Montgomery, the Blunt Cultural Park, most people refer to probably as the Shakespeare Park. Even yes, though, they absolutely uh, do. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, we can't get we just can't get around it. <laughs> it's yep. okay though. Yep, we're in the same place as the theater. Yeah, so it's 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 you guys, the theater, and then at the other end of the park, it's the dog park, right? Dog park. Yeah. Yep. How does how did that work? I'm not quite sure. Although I have no problem with that, I'm, I will quickly say I think that <laughs> dogs are often in a cultural experience. Yes, yes. Um, and then on the other end of it, uh, have you put together shows that then travel in the same way of, that these shows that uh, you've brought in? Yes, um, but not for a while. I was about to say you don't um, sound that, enthused. Well, th well, I was. You know, I mentioned earlier, kind of when we started this part of the conversation, that the ecosystem is quite different. Um. And it is the the um, the ability to put together shows to travel uh, for a museum like Montgomery has really uh, kind of cycled down in the last ten years. Okay. Jennifer, the other curator, has put together, and there actually is a show traveling now oh, cool. of contemporary ceramics that she put together uh, that traveling to two other museums. The reason that she could kind of do that, though, is because this is contemporary or modern material as opposed to the historical material that I'm really more interested in. Mm -hmm. um, the, the historical material is just more difficult to get for traveling exhibitions now for any number of reasons. But the primary one is there's just a greater emphasis now amongst any 
any institution that owns this kind of material in being much more conscientious about uh, loaning that material and exposing it to the hazards of travel. So conservation the is the issue there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And people have become much more conservation uh, aware and much more reluctant to uh, to submit uh, an ex- you know to work to an exhibition that would be traveling like that. The, the, the one exhibition that I worked, well, I worked on, a co- you know, in a, in a span of over 30 years, I've worked on a lot of these, but the one I really loved and the, that I think probably to me is, will always be sort of like the one that I look back upon with the most pleasure was really one of the first that I did, shows that I put together mm-hmm. with a curator uh, jointly from the what was then called the National Collection of Fine Arts, the NCFA, which is now the Smithsonian American Art Museum for oh. those people who are aware of that American Art Museum at the Smithsonian. Uh, I worked with one of their curators, and this was right after I had come back to work at the museum and was hired as a as a curator. Um, and it was a show about um, uh, an exhibition program that was put together by the U.S. State Department right after World War II to travel work in Europe and in uh, the Caribbean that was basically kind of reflecting uh, the the Amer- American values, so to speak. The idea was, you know, we're going to share our art with you to kind of cheer you up after your lives have all been <laughs> disrupted by a war, right? Yeah. Which, yeah, of course, it's kind of an American, you know, yeah. sort of... it's very propagandic. Thing. Kind of an arrogant thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it was put together literally by the USIA, which was U.S. Information yep. Services, but which, yeah, it was very, it was very much propaganda. Anyway, Man, I'd almost like to see thing, that show now. The whole thing blew up. Um, we've got books on it. You can, you can probably even look it up online. It was oh, cool. called Advancing American Art. Advancing American it, Art, okay. Advancing American Art, and... The the reason that I got involved was, and this is el- this is elementary to being a curator. So I was really really fortunate to kind of leap into this right out of the gate when I came back. I was told that Auburn University in Auburn had a collection of paintings um, that were stored uh, not very well. Uh-huh. Um, and that the one of the art professors there had contacted our museum and my supervisor at the time, who was uh, the, cur- the the main curator, um, about whether or not our museum would take would help them figure out how to take care of these works. Uh-huh. He went over there, and he discovered that um, there were literally, I don't remember the exact number now, less than 40, uh, somewhere in the 30 no, range, a number of paintings. And when he walked in, he discovered that these paintings were made by people like John Marin and Georgia O'Keeffe. And um, there's not a Marston Hartley there, but the, the quality, an Arthur does. Uh, these were fabulously well-known, very highly respected important American painters of the 1930s and 40s in this collection, and they were basically being stored in a boiler room. Oh, God. Um, um, Margaret Lynn, so, let me stop you really quick. I need to type yeah. something, and the noise is just going to be awful. Okay. Oh, oh, they figured it out. Don't worry about it. Uh, okay. The audio... Okay, cool. So we're back on. I'm done typing. The noise is not so awful. Uh, so okay. you were talking about this collection from just right after World War II, and, and you guys, so did you decide to take the paintings? Well, yeah. What was interesting about it was that the, every, the, the art professors there knew that the works were important and asked um, if we would look into this, but then we had to kind of negotiate uh, with the the management, the administration of the university, who owned the paintings, uh, about you know what what we would what we could and would do. Mm-hmm. So we we did go and get the paintings, brought them to the museum, and and my job was basically to write a grant 
uh, to get these paintings conserved because as you can imagine after having been stored in a boiler room and upside down on top of the Georgia O'Keeffe was literally upside down on top of a filing cabinet when it was oh down. geez uh, yeah so our and how, our, how many works were we talking about uh, in the 30s uh, oh geez I don't wow okay so that's a I mean, rather I could, large I, collection I could, yeah I could I could look it up but and some of them on paper were in better stored in better shape but they had been uh, well anyway you can imagine yeah so I got busy um, trying to figure, number one, what are these things? How did they get there? Which then led me to this project of, called Advancing American Art. Yeah. And then we, I contacted the woman that I partnered with, um, whose name is Virginia Mecklenburg. She's now one of the senior curators at the uh, Smithsonian American Art Museum. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we looked into this and I basically went back to the director of the museum at the time and my supervisor, the curator, and said, look, you know, if we're going to uh, apply for a grant to conserve this work, we we really need to demonstrate how the work is going to be used uh, in, you know, and, and preserved and made available to the public. They're not just going to give us a bunch of money to conserve these paintings, to put them in a the storeroom. And, yeah, and they, of course, sure. agreed with that. And so we began, uh, Virginia and I began looking into putting together an exhibition that would be uh, jointly organized by the Smithsonian and, and he, we, us here in Montgomery, which we did. Um, and long story short, found a number of the other paintings. Part of my job was tracking down other paintings from the collection. A large number of them actually ended up at the University of Oklahoma. Weird. Okay. And I won't go into how all that happened, yep. no, but that's fine. It, it's, it's a complicated story. <laughs> but bet. we tracked down a, a significant number of the paintings, put the shows together, it, and we traveled it to the the Smithsonian. Obviously, they exhibited it, and oh, then great. the University, uh, the Benton Museum at the University of Connecticut, and then it was exhibited at the Terra Foundation in uh, out in, in Chicago. Mm-hmm. So that was really my first experience of putting together an exhibition to travel. And it was a, there was a very sound rationale for it. Um, yeah. We did get funding from NEA for working on, for putting the show together. So this is, this, that was then. Yeah. Okay, so And you guys now, should re-show that. That would be really cool to see nowadays. They actually put it together. Well, they put a version of it together about 10 years ago over at Jewel Collins Smith. That's um, still a long museum. time ago. Yeah. Well, it was. Yeah. It, it, and it was. It's still a great show. Actually, it's still That's good. the work is still really amazing. Um, but the the ecosystem for this now is that if I were to try to do that again, it would probably require massive amounts of paperwork to get the loans, plus a tremendous amount of money expended in making those works available by the owners because of the conservation work that they would basically demand be done. Oh, I see. So where I could, you know, where I could say, hey, we can do this exhibition, as I just just described it to you, Mm -hmm. we can do this for $50,000. Okay. Now that exhibition would be, you know, anywhere from $300,000 up. Wow. Just just that. Just because of the increased cost. You know, inflation taken into yeah, yeah, account of too, but it just becomes more difficult. So, uh, this cue, what we're thinking about now, which is what is really starting to happen, which had to happen, is um, we were invited last year um, to be part of a consortium agreement that includes the Wadsworth Athenaeum up in Hartford, Connecticut. Okay. And uh, the museum in Columbia, South Carolina, is also included in it, and a couple of other regional museums, I think. Mm -hmm. And we're going to work cooperatively as a consortium of museums to put together uh, exhibitions for our museums. Oh, kind of like library Uh, lending, but for art. Yeah. That's cool. Well, the the curators are going to get together and figure out themes for exhibitions that we can mount uh, through our co- from our collections by joining our collection mm-hmm. and we're going to begin putting those shows together to travel amongst partner museums 
That's great. And and this is, I think, the the way of the future uh, in terms of people who are working in art museums or have an interest in working in art museums. That kind of collaborative effort is going to be uh, completely necessary in order to be able to financially um, make feasible for you know institutions with with more not not unlimited budgets yeah i was about to say for about every- regional museums and places that are free yeah. museums and things like that i imagine the budgets yes. are relatively uh limited yes they are limited and they're going to obviously become more limited in the short term especially yeah so then we're going to have to get very creative about how we're doing this and at the museum here in montgomery i'm not telling anybody somebody that they don't already know if they come frequently we've utilized our permanent collection a lot uh, yeah. in the past five years which is why you know when you asked me what's the last thing you travel it's it's been a very long time <laughs> since i organized an exhibition to travel I, probably the last one that traveled was um a show that we did of uh whistler prints okay uh, that and i worked on that show but it, that's been quite some time ago we've done some glass shows but really all of the traveling shows and we haven't st- traveling shows as i say there's one now traveling that was organized by jennifer but the work in them is is more contemporary or modern okay cool um and uh i'm we were talking about your other show and i said that 10 years is a long time ago how if if a certain set of work goes up on the walls of the museum how long is it going to be before we see either that show or that piece of work again you you probably wouldn't necessarily see that same same show again okay um, it, you know, once it's been done and documented, it's not like we seek to go back and recreate necessarily, other than in the case of Advancing American Art, and that was almost unique. Okay. Um, but, and it kind of depends. You, for example, we, last summer, not last summer, I guess the summer before last, I put together an exhibition from our collection called Past Perfected, mm-hmm. which was portraits of children. Um, that one. And yeah. yeah, and and so it, you will see those paintings, a number of those paintings, you'll see in our permanent collection up all the time. So they're back on view and stay on view. Oh, okay. Uh, but but works on paper, for example, like uh, I think I exhibited some prints that had uh, children in them. Mm-hmm. Uh, those those would not go back up for a very you know, extended period because we have restrictions on the amount of time we can subject works on paper to exhibition life. Yeah, I think we'll talk about so. that a little bit later. Um, so, so if I tell my students to go look at work, or if I tell, or if I say, "Hey, this cool show is up to to somebody," um, is it five years, ten years before some of that work goes back up, or um, if it's not on uh, permanent display? Oh yeah. Um, you know, I would say. For works on paper, or let's just well, well, let's take our photography collection for example. Yeah. We wouldn't really re-exhibit a photograph more than about every other year. Oh, okay, that so every other year is kind of, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Oh yeah, but that would be for example, we have a Joseph, uh, a Yusuf Karsh, a portrait of Martin Luther King. Okay. Well, of course, we want to exhibit that. All the time at Black yeah. History Month because everybody would love to see this beautiful portrait of Dr. Martin Luther King, but we we have to like hold back and you know try to exhibit it about only every other year, or three years, just just to to say that you know to preserve. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. But then in the in the case of the more rare stuff, are there pieces that I'm going to see once and then not see for another ten years, or yeah, probably, only only if it's something that really we don't have that. That every 10 year scenario is more not because we wouldn't want to show it, but because we don't have this ability to show it in the space that we have. Okay. Especially works on paper. Yeah. Because we only have a couple of spaces devoted to rotating our permanent collection that's not painting and sculpture. Yeah. And the works on um, paper, we, is that small gallery? Is that what that is? Yeah, the the wheel print room, which is the one that's kind of in the middle and kind of off the little corridor mm-hmm. uh, in the, the temporary exhibition galleries, that wheel print room is solely devoted to exhibiting works on paper. But we've got over uh, probably 
more than 2,500 works on paper. And what, so you can kind you can put of put up probably 20 that, in that room at any time? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, okay. Max. And, and, and we put them up for, you know, there's, there's a context for them. We, we come up with a theme for why we put the work together and then we, yeah. you know, try to connect the work. So uh, that means that there may be something that's up that, that is in our collection that it just simply didn't fit a theme for a number of years, so we didn't mm -hmm. use it. But eventually, everything gets shown. I mean, it, we will, over time, rotate all this work because we, we need to have it out if we own it, number one. And number two, uh, we need the work on the walls, too. So Yeah. Um, and Okay, so, so kind of stemming from that, um, you talked about how, how works on paper and photographs can only be out every so often. Um, let's go through some of that stuff of what it, what does it take to actually conserve these works? Why can they only be shown so often? Uh, what does it take to do that? Um, yeah. What are all of our... Because I think that most people, when they, when they go to a museum, think of this incredibly clean, perfect space for art. And when a curator says, oh, we can only have it up so often because this is a bad environment for it, we all are going to look at you crazy. Yeah, probably. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, well, okay. Well, the first thing is there it depends upon the material that the art is made out of. Mm -hmm. That that when you talk about conserving or preserving works of art, what you're really talking about is what what are the physical qualities of that material from which the work is made and what do we have to do to to retard the degradation of that material over time. It's kind of a chemical and physics thing. Yeah. It's more science-based than art-based. So let's take, for example, um, something that we have on view all the time, and that is a marble sculpture by a woman named Edmonia Lewis, who was a 19th century uh, sculptor, American sculptor, who worked in Italy. And... Um, we have a sculpture called the Marriage of Hiawatha. Which one is that? Um, if you go into the, the permanent collections galleries, it's on the right-hand side just as you go in, and it shows Hiawatha and his uh, his, his bride. Oh, okay, yeah. Of, I know which one you're talking about. Yeah. So, so here we're talking about marble. Marble as stone is really pretty impervious. Uh, in other words, you can you can light it all day long. You can give it as much light as you want. Mm -hmm. uh, you can basically the environment around it, unless there is a, a pollutant in the environment. Yeah, and there's acid, not right? in our museum. Uh, it's 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 just gonna be there. It's not gonna change. The only thing that could really happen to that is it could be ha damaged in handling. So dropped. Which is, <laughs> Correct. If it were cracked, broken, you know, some something like that, it's, which is why we never move it. <laughs> which is why that seems I'm, like a I, good way I, to take care of it. <laughs> which, which is what yeah, exactly. Which is why I hyperventilate when people write and say they want to borrow it. Um, so that that's really the only thing you could do. To that it's it's just in great shape, living right where it lives. Another example of something like that is the the um, cast glass piece. Uh -huh. uh, by Karen Lamont of the the Oriental, I'm sorry, the Asian kimono kind of form <laughs> that's in the back. Sorry, uh, that's in the back uh, of in the Young Gallery. It's cast glass. It's fine. You yep. can load it up with light. You can subject it to almost any environment. So those materials mean they can stay all day long wherever they are. They're going to be fine unless somebody moves them and makes a mistake in moving them okay then you have paintings well let's but that... before you move on to paintings uh let's yes. take a yep. quick rejoinder there and you corrected yourself um you said oriental and then switched I over did. to the term asian and i think yep. that it's something that most people don't either don't understand the difference between it or don't, don't understand why the word oriental was used for a long time and why it was switched. Yeah. Uh, could you just yeah. go into that for just a few seconds just to well, explain that, why a, those things it, are used? It's a little bit of sensitivity uh, that we have now mm -hmm. to uh, what's called cultural appropriation, mm -hmm. where uh, oriental was a term that was used, and, and really orient 
simply is sort of a European derived term for the ancient East. Yeah. Um, and and unfortunately, in over time, it it took on more of a, um, a kind of a not it's not uh, denigrating, but it was sort of patronizing. Yeah. So and people who utilized it were utilizing elements of the culture in a patronizing way. And that word has sort of gotten connected to the, that practice, I think. Okay. So people today uh, attempt to be a little more sensitive to really being neutral in the way that we refer to uh, cultural manifestations yeah, that makes of other sense. cultures and, res and respectful of them. Uh, so Asian is a geographic designation, which makes, uh, you know, it's, it's a little more neutral and okay. there's no judgment. All yeah. right, cool. Thank you for that. Uh, so, I just wanted but, to, to but yes, make that clear. Yes, my use of that term just reflects my age, <laughs> I think. Well, I think it also uh, uh, has a different connotation in, in art history where, where Orientalist art was a thing for a while. Right. Um, yes, very yeah. much so. Okay, so... so Moving on to paintings. What Back are... on to paintings. Paintings, yeah. So paintings are another element. Paintings can be made with different binders. There's mm. oil. There's acrylic. There's it's not water. It's basically a you know a, a chemical. Uh, but the the medium that the pigment, yeah, paint pigment is in makes a difference as to how that is going to uh, survive over time. Uh -huh. Gum Arabic is what I was trying to come up with for watercolor usually. Um, how that's going to survive over time and what its support is. And the support is what we refer to as what it's put on. So a support would be uh, at one end of the spectrum a piece of paper and at yep. the other end of the spectrum a piece of wood. Okay. And in the middle, you have all kinds of fabric. So you have to analyze what is this painting made of. Again, we go back to the chemistry and the physics. So let's just take an example. For an example, I'm just going to take a painting from the Blunt collection um, that I'm real familiar with. That it's a, a painting of, uh, and we, we focused on this actually on Facebook recently. Some people might have seen a picture of this on Facebook um, of a woman standing in Central Park by yeah. William Merritt Chase. That painting is on a, a, a canvas, a professional canvas. William Merritt Chase was a very highly trained professional artist, so uh, the paintings that he made were well constructed of a very professional level material. Okay. Right? So when I look at that painting, I'm seeing professionally uh, woven um, and marketed canvas okay. from the 19th century and professionally mixed um, pigment by an artist who was highly skilled at doing all of that using a technique that was also that he learned in an art school okay so so that kind of painting is generally considered pretty stable um, all the other things being equal, if it's been kept in a, in a stable environment, and in this particular case, this painting by William Merritt Chase was apparently kept in a domestic environment with fairly good control over the environment. It was never subjected to, to water or a lot of smoke or any other kind of pollutant. So the structure of this painting is very sound. and. Overall, we feel very comfortable leaving it hanging in the blunt all the time because okay. it, it's it's in a protected environment in our museum with a controlled light level and no pollutants. There's nothing that's going to harm it. Um, on the other end of the spectrum with painting, um, there it's a lot of some of the uh, students or your listeners are probably going to be familiar with a woman named Zelda Fitzgerald, mm -hmm. who was uh, a native of Montgomery. He was married to Scott Fitzgerald. And the museum has a number of paintings by her that she made in the 1930s 
uh, most of them were made in the 30s. And uh, she was a, an example of a, an artist who was using materials that were probably commercial art material. But she was never trained in an art school in the same way that someone like William Merritt Chase or other artists were trained. So, for example, we were given as a gift um, a number of years ago a painting by her uh, in an estate. And when I went to get the painting from the, the estate holder, I walked in and basically I was presented with the painting that was laying flat on the table and every bit of the painting had lifted up off the canvas, Oof. like curled up in little, little bowl. It looked like little bowl. Oh, that gives me the fear. All over, all over the, the canvas, right? Yeah, I don't uh, like and that. And that was, that was, well, it was, it was terrible. It was awful. If it had been hanging on the wall, everything would have fallen off. The little cups were hug, hanging on by, you know, a breath there at the base of the little cup. So mm -hmm. we took the painting to the museum and we arranged to have a conservator put um, an adhesive and rice paper on it in order to save the paint in the orientation it was on the canvas and keep it uh, stable until we could get it to the uh, laboratory of a conservator over land to treat it. So if you walked into the museum today, painting on the wall, you would never know that that had happened. You wouldn't have even recognized the painting that I saw. Oh, really? Oh, I did. I wouldn't have recognized it as a painting actually at the time. I couldn't have even told you what the composition was. But when it was put back down, laid back down by the conservators, it's a, a very beautiful painting of red poppies, oh, uh, wow. and it hangs in the museum all the time, and it's in in good shape now because it received that professional treatment. So, and then, it, you know, again, at another end of the spectrum is uh, the, the works that we have that are water. Uh, and those, we have some that are extremely beautiful and very important. We have two outstanding watercolors by the artist Edward Hopper. No, we don't show them. I mean, we rarely show them. They were ongoing view when they were first given to the museum mm -hmm. for about eight eight or ten years. Sorry, let me stop you for so, just a second. Just pause yes. for a second. Okay, you're good. There's There was a door opening and closing. That's fine. It's uh, all better that's now. Okay, all good. Yep. Take, tell, that, t tell, tell that door to behave itself. Now, um, yeah, door, so, behave yourself. Behave yourself, door. Um, so the hoppers, we don't exhibit because they were what I would call overexposed when we, they were first given to the museum. Okay. So we only exhibit them very, very rarely. And, but we do exhibit them, uh, you know, it, over, over a period of a couple of years they'll come out. Uh, but, but there are reasons why we just can't exhibit something as much as we might choose to. So now, and, so and now for... the reasons are conservation and space to exhibit them. So normally. for the watercolors, um, the, is it the, is it the paint pigment that will fail or is it the paper or is it a binder? What's, what's going on there? All of it, but, oh, but really? less, the, <laughs> less the binder and more the paper. Um, okay. Well, pa paper inherently, as you know, is just fragile, yeah. can tear easily. Uh, the other thing about those watercolors, and let's just take a watercolor by Edward Hopper, for example, when he painted it, he would have sent it through his dealer, a uh -huh. guy named Frank Rain, um, and, and there they would have uh, framed it, mounted it to his specification. Well, at the time they weren't really as cognizant of the the need to use acid free materials in mounting works on paper oh. in order to preserve them there's a tremendous amount of acidity in what you and I and a lot of your are going to think of as mat board yeah. if it's not 100% rag mat board it's got a tremendous acidic quality and quotient mm -hmm. which can destroy paper over time if it's framed matted and never taken out of the frame and remount. So we are hypersensitive to that in the art.
You cut out there. Are you still there? All right, we're going to pause this thing and get started when she gets back. Darted. Um, yeah, so we're talking about watercolor before the internet was so rudely broken. Um, <laughs> and uh, so well, I guess a good thing to say with that is, is if I'm a painter and I want a painting to last forever, how do I paint it? <laughs> or would that be a conservationist question? De define forever. <laughs> five hundred years. Like we we, yeah. we we see stuff in class that's five hundred years old, or a thousand years old, or two thousand years old. How do I make? Yeah. How do I do that? Apparently, well, not watercolor. No, no, definitely not. And okay. choose your materials carefully. Yeah. Okay. You think about the things that do survive five hundred years. What mm -hmm. what are they made of? Usually, they're made of. Uh, fairly durable material like uh, marble and glass and stone, okay. uh, other kinds of stone. And uh, if you're talking about paintings, actually, you know, there are paintings that were made in the, um, the 12th century in, um, in Italy mm -hmm. on panel mm -hmm. that are survived just beautifully and are look, basically, I think, may look like out like the day that they were painted because they were cared for usually in churches and they were on on wood uh, in a fairly uh, kept in a fairly dry environment a lot of time they used egg tempera which isn't that weird that something made of an egg <laughs> yeah, can we, hold that binder we discussed yeah, that in that class about how uh, protein, protein binding in there, yep. just, it, it just lasts forever so well, yeah, think tempera it's a good medium um, and then, of course, there are oil paintings that also survive for many hundreds of years that are in excellent condition. Just a lot of it depends upon how it's cared for overall. So if, Absolutely. if I'm keeping a, a painting in my house or I'm keeping any work of art in my house, what am I looking for? What am I trying to do? Well, the, the main thing is if it's comfortable for you, uh, it's probably comfortable for a painting. In other words, uh, you know, you if you if you got a, an overly humid environment mm -hmm. especially in a place like alabama it's going to encourage mold growth uh you want to make sure that you obviously anything that if you if you live in a home where you have carpet um or a sofa that's around a window mm -hmm. and you move that carpet and you see that the place under the carpet looks darker than the floor around it uh, the that tells you what the uv is doing from coming through your windows yeah so around here really... around here you can see it on the roofs of uh older darker cars get all faded and busted up from the sun yeah exactly so you uv light coming in even on oil paintings i mean it won't do a tremendous amount of damage but over time it's going to fade fabric it's going to fade most anything so you you want to protect uh from uv light as much as you can um and obviously works on paper are a lot uh, a much uh, different uh, you know category too because light will not only degrade the fibers in the paper but it will over time fade that pigment because okay. the pigment itself being um, emulsified with gum arabic it's just less pigment there's less pigment there to hold on to oh. so so for example i'll just use me as an example for what i've always done in my own home i had uh, a couple of works on paper that i exhibited that I exhibited that i kept on the walls in my home mm -hmm. i left them in my hallway where it was it was relatively dark and i could see them but okay. I couldn't really, um, uh, they couldn't really get too much light. And I, you know, I have... And by light, we're talking about sunlight, right? We're talking about high ultraviolet uh, sun, sources. Well, sunlight, well, artificial light sources too, but that they're, they're usually a lot less intense than direct sunlight. Yeah. And, um, and, so and any modern LED should be okay with that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. No, LEDs are, are changing the whole landscape for oh, that's great. lighting works of art period yeah for sure yeah because ultraviolet the thing that gives you a sunburn will also break up your artwork yes it will <laughs> um, quickly too yeah seriously and uh you guys actually just put in a bunch of um outdoor space 
uh, with big sculptures out there. Uh, is there anything special mm -hmm. for things that, that have to survive out there other than just being exposed to water? Oh, that's a, you know, that's a really uh, hot topic now amongst people. You, you know, earlier in our conversation, we were talking about how conservators are sort of ruling the landscape in terms of, no, you can't send that painting because yeah. it's too fragile and meh, 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 meh. Well, yeah. it's, it's now extending to uh, a conversation about what is really appropriate for exhibiting uh, outside uh, mm -hmm. in our country, really anywhere in the world. And the biggest factor with that is now pollution, to be honest with you. Industrial okay. environments and pollutants do a tremendous amount of damage to sculpture. You know, up until the 19th century, all of those beautiful travertine and marble pieces over in um, uh, Italy and in Europe were in beautiful condition. Mm -hmm. But look at what happened to all the sculpture. They very quickly decided in the early 20th century that the sculptures, the most important sculptures in Rome or Florence, they were all taken inside yeah. where they could control the environment better because of the pollutants in the air. So well, as it relates um, to us here in Montgomery... I was going to say, that we, that is acid uh, eating the marble, correct, in a lot of those? Yes, correct. Yeah. And uh, I know it, that you have marble countertops that we can't get lemon juice on, and same with mine. That's right. Yeah. We, we avoid that at all costs. Um, we, we're very careful about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, vinegar, you know, any acid. We don't want acid on there. Uh, and and that pollutant is typically acid. It, it's, it is acid. It's yeah. acidity. So we essentially c conceive that the, the best chance of survival over time for sculpture out of doors mm -hmm. is material that is more impervious to that. Okay. And that would be metal, obviously, mm -hmm. um, painted metal. Ceramic, actually, um, yeah, I could see will that. survive. It's glazed. It's, you know, it's sealed. Um, wood, not good because of the, the dampness, the exposure to the UV. Um, so... It, well, and so so it kind of is a balancing act. Uh, at the museum here in Montgomery, one of the things that we set out as a, a kind of a policy or a practice, I would say practice more than a policy, is we we like to we want to be able to install temporary sculpture. We want it out there just for a while, mm -hmm. and then it's going to go away. It's not going to be part of our permanent collection. It's going to be something that we borrow or yeah. that we install and then it leaves and goes elsewhere. The The most recent addition, which a lot of people haven't really been able to see yet, is is the sculpture that was just made by Patrick Doherty. That was just about an environmental about that. sculpture. Yeah, a sculpture up in, based in North Carolina, who has built this wonderful kind of um, environment, kind of hut collection of sticks uh, in the top of at the top of the sculpture garden, uh, and its lifespan is you know probably anywhere from eighteen months to two years, okay. uh, and we're happy about that. It, it, and it, now it, on a on a piece like that that's meant to to kind of be part of the environment and meant to degrade. Yes, degrade. Um, yes. What are your guys' responsibilities as curators and conservationists? Do you actually do anything to take care of it after the initial point or do you just kind of follow the instructions of whichever artist uh how yeah. is that handled a absolutely that that is kind of planned obsolescence on the part of the artist okay so our major role here is to make sure that because we are going to allow people to have access to it to experience mm -hmm. it as an environment our major role there becomes safety yeah, so like, like people can to... get inside of it, but you don't want people climbing on it. Correct. Uh, yeah. Or I mean, we also want to be aware of the social integrity of it so that there so are pieces fall down. and parts that are <laughs> hitting people. Yes, so that's no that good either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that, that makes a lot of good sense. And, and since we've re referenced it twice, um, if people want to see pictures of that, there's a Facebook group or there's a Facebook yep. uh, page for the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts. Absolutely. Yeah, I would encourage everybody to go in and follow our Facebook page because we actually have um, 
uh, a number of things that we're putting up that kind of give access to the museum and the collection during this over, quarantine um, stuff, right? Uh, yeah, dur during quarantine. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, great. And that's just Micro Museum of Fine Arts on Facebook. Is there anything yeah. else that would be a good link? I'm looking over at Sarah right Web now. Website, which would be mmfa.org. Okay, mmfa.org. Anything else? Mm hmm. Yep. There's lots of information on there, including. The ability to go in, I would encourage people to go in and look at um, our collection online because we've got a significant amount of our collection under the um, art tab okay. is accessible for looking at and there's information about a number of the pieces there. And oh, that's great. So it's po possible to look at it and learn a little bit about it if you want to. And uh, Sorry, Margaret Lynn. Uh, Sarah, do you guys have Twitter or Instagram? And there's both Twitter and Instagram, and what are those? Mm -hmm. At Montgomery MFA. At Montgomery MFA? Mm -hmm. uh, for both of them? Yes. Okay, cool. So for Twitter and Instagram, it's at Montgomery MFA, I guess. Um, yeah. But yeah, so that's cool. So they can see that piece that just went up, because, yeah, the, that wasn't even finished until uh, all this quarantine foolishness began, or not foolishness, very important quarantine stuff. Uh, <laughs> started <laughs> yes. uh, yeah so nobody's been it able was, to see that piece no I don't I, I certainly haven't uh, been able to see it myself in person so yeah there well, we go I, I didn't see it when it was done but I saw it when it was pretty far along and it's a very very interesting and attractive piece of art um, yeah, yeah. there's apparently a time-lapse video of it online according to Sarah there is um, is it just there, on the it, website or is it on social media too Okay, so she says it'd be harder to find on Facebook, but it is on there if you want to find it on there as well. Um, yeah, yeah, and it's great because it really shows the if you if you're an artist and you know you think the life is your oyster, look at all the weather they had to contend with. Uh, yeah, in that, that video. is one of the really interesting things that in that thing video. Put together. <laughs> all the clouds going over the top ended up looking really cool. That did. Those accidental things were always really great. Mm -hmm. um, what else we want? What else did I want to grab you for? Oh, yeah, this is an important one, I think, for, for most normal folks. Uh, what's the difference between a collection and the way a museum has a collection and just my random hoard of stuff I have at my house? Oh. Not my particular well, hoard. The, I, I, do, I don't. The general we're not hoard. Talking about you specifically, we're talking about people who acquire things. Mm -hmm. uh, for themselves versus museums collecting in a rational and reasoned way mm -hmm. uh, in order to form what is considered a, a legitimate collection of objects that meets a, a need or a mission. Uh, and in the case of the museum here in Montgomery, which is of course what I'm familiar with, our, we have an acquisitions policy uh -huh. And the acquisitions policy of a museum guide, what that museum does collect. Um, th there are things that fall within the scope of the policy that are collected. There are things that fall without the scope, and they are not collected. Okay. For example, we uh, made it, or we, not we, me, but the museum's board made a decision back in the 1970s to focus on collecting American works of art uh, painting sculpture works on paper okay. and over time we added certain areas to that uh, at the same time that they embraced that collecting focus for painting sculpture works on paper they incorporated the collection uh, within the collections policy of old master prints that we have mm -hmm. uh, which basically 15th century European uh, to 20th to, to early 20th century, uh, that, well, late 19th century, that was incorporated. And over time, we added uh, certain areas of decorative arts. Uh, mm -hmm. There was, a, uh, there was a, a patron here in town who was very interested in porcelain uh, and collected Worcester porcelain, which is a kind of English porcelain. And the museum, they offered the, a collection of these works to the museum, 
And the reason that they were taken and incorporated into the collection was not because it related to anything else that we had other than it was European, related to prints in some ways. But basically they offered it as a collection. Same thing with Chinese export porcelain. Uh. The thing about a museum is, as a museum, while I could go out and buy a single piece of Worcester porcelain that I really liked, and then maybe I would buy another one. Mm -hmm. um, it has meaning to me personally, but anything that the museum collects has to be collected in a way that we can educate about it and okay, say, so the... why is this important? What is the significance of this work? What function did it play in its lifetime or the lifetimes of the people that made it, had it, owned it? What is its cultural significance? It, everything that the museum collects is collected for basically uh, providing a context for other objects of its kind and for expanding the knowledge base of what happened over history with art. Okay, so just so, real quickly, how do you how um, how does the museum square like the the older European collection with with the I guess the main focus? I don't know how you'd say it, but the main focus of collecting American art. Um, basically, you could, well, well, think about it. I mean, the Metropolitan collects every freaking thing in the yeah, world, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. Um, and it's all about your resource. Um, we collect this material that we feel we can educate people about. It doesn't have to all hang together mm. um, all the time. Um, okay. In other words, we look for ways to connect our collection of, say, Worcester porcelain to our collection of Chinese export and how that kind of, where they overlap in terms of what they are, the materials they are, how they're decorated, mm -hmm. what the decoration is, what the influence is for the decoration. You know, all of that adds to, again, kind of the knowledge base and may answer questions for people and make them understand why these, these things are important and should be saved for mm -hmm. posterity but that they don't necessarily have to all relate directly to one another certainly i would say our traditional african material that i referenced earlier doesn't have a necessarily direct correlation to a, another a lot of the other elements of our collection but we can contextualize it within itself and mm -hmm. interestingly I, I like to think about it and really have started looking closely for the links that I can see between um, traditional African material and the kinds of, of themes and materials and ideas and forms and and all of that in some self-taught art from the Southeast. Mm -hmm. um, there, you know, there's an emphasis on things like weaving uh, and the use of, of uh, natural material. And it, it's very basic, but it's kind of there. Mm -hmm. So it kind of gives people an entree, I think, to sort of begin to think about the big picture of art and where these ideas come from and how they flowed over time and what people thought of as art uh, that, that, they, you, that we now think of as art that people used to didn't think of as art. Certainly, you know, an, an element of that in our collection that is massive is quilt. Yeah. Um, yeah. We've got a and tremendous collection of West Alabama quilts. And, you know, even, even, well, probably 50, 50 years or more ago, people would never have dreamed of a quilt on the wall of an art museum. Yeah. I mean, it just wasn't considered an art form. Mm -hmm. It is now, but it wasn't then. So it all, it all changes over time. So, and museums are doing that. You know, museums are trying to make that connection for us in our in our society to those societies of the past and trying to pull in things that kind of just didn't really register with people at the time uh -huh. but the importance of kind of having that material understanding it and seeing where it took us that's really cool um and then there was a there uh i guess i'll get onto it in a minute um so when you when somebody offers you something like say I have this painting that I think is 
the mat that works with your collection how does that yeah. go about happening do you d does somebody else handle that or do you guys handle that what what, what goes on we, um well, and just whether or not you guys want to take it not the physical aspects right. of it right sure um well there's there's several i mean there is a process okay for accepting work into the museum's collection uh, when an offer like that is made the curators look at it the curators and the director look at it to determine does it meet the, the criteria for the collection it has mm -hmm. nothing to do with do we like it or not like it or think it's good or not good nothing yeah. it's just does it meet the criteria once we dis we say no it doesn't meet the criteria and that happens a lot i get calls from people <laughs> saying gee i'd love to get my great grandfather had this old um, medal that he got in Europe and then in where it's this thing and you know well I can basically tell them no that doesn't meet the criteria of our collection thank you so much for the offer you know maybe yeah. try these people um, but once we look at it and say technically yes it would meet the criteria Mm -hmm. Then we have to, we go to our, normally what happens is we go to our uh, collections committee, which meets several times a year, and we present these works and say why we think that this piece would be an appropriate addition to the collection, or not. I mean, we, we may say, you know, we don't feel that we can adequately care for this. It's, you know, it's got these issues or that issue or whatever. Um, or we can't contextualize it, or there may be any of a number. It, it's all individual <laughs> judgment based upon what the thing is and how it relates to everything else we have. Mm -hmm. So that process, um, we go through the process of presenting it to the collections committee, and they are really the group that work with us and say, yes, we agree with you, or no, we don't agree, and we have a discussion about it. Um, but and this is the important thing in my mind as the curator okay when we take something for our permanent collection when we accept it into the collection it's in perpetuity that means forever that means the museum is is committed to giving that thing whatever it is the best possible care it can for the rest of time and mm -hmm. that's a huge responsibility, especially when you're taking on something inherent problems physically. When we're going back to the chemistry and the physics again. So, like a t the, taking on that painting that had all the little cupped pieces of paint. Correct. Correct. So, very good example. So, why would I pull for that? Why would I kind of go, wait? You know, even though I can't even see what the composition was. And it's literally falling off the canvas. Is there something that can be done to save it? Yes, there is. Why do we want to save it? Why do we want to take it? Why do we want to... Well, the reason is because we have other examples by this artist, and she was from Montgomery. And mm. she was a fairly important figure uh, culturally in the 1920s. Zelda Fitzgerald was very well known internationally in the 1920s. Yeah. And she happened to be an artist who took serious interest in her art, especially at the end of her life. Uh, and because she had that local connection, we felt, as the art museum of her hometown, we owed it to ourselves and to her to save this example of her work if we could do that. And so we did. Awesome. Um, so there, there's a rationale behind every decision. But the rationale has to be informed by we're making a, a commitment for all time to care for this work, and that's a very serious commitment to make. Yeah, that's so interesting so. to think about. Uh, and now while we're on the topic of uh, acquiring stuff, um, there's also a new word that I had never heard before hanging out with you guys uh, called deaccessioning. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes. So what is, oh, yeah. what is deaccessioning? Deaccessioning. Well, the reason we want to be so extremely careful about what we take for the collection 
and go through all of these steps that I just described is because we don't want to have to do what is called deaccessioning. And deaccessioning is simply taking something out of the collection that has been accepted into it. Uh. And museums really, really hate the concept of deaccessioning. Um, it, it's a very fraught process. Every museum, every professionally managed museum, in order to deaccession from the collection, has to go through a tremendous number of steps, uh, identifying how the work came in, who it, who it, who it, who it came from, when it came, how it was acquired, are there heirs that are still living for the, uh, people who had given work, um, uh, trying to track think about those that. people down. Yeah. Oh, it, it's it's a it's such a huge undertaking. And almost every museum, including our museum, at its, the beginning of its life as a museum, uh, acquired things that don't that no longer really contribute to the collection as a whole because of the the change over time in focus. And these are normally like one-off things. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to remember. I know we've ex we've deaccessioned um, some paintings that came into the collection in the 1930s uh, and this is just a, a single example. We took something that was attributed to the artist Thomas Sully, mm -hmm. uh, the portraitist, who's a, a fairly prominent, well-known 19th century American portrait painter. Uh -huh. The painting was horrible. <laughs> it clearly wouldn't have been made by a professional <laughs> painter like Thomas Sully. It was in ter it was in terrible condition. It was a terrible painting to begin with. It was just sad. And why anybody would have put Thomas Sully's name on still up for debate. But for whatever reason it, it came into the collection that way. Well, over time we did the research necessary to to show no is not by Thomas Sully. It it's got all of these issues that don't are not consistent with work by Thomas Sully. All mm -hmm. this. And eventually we deaccessioned it, meaning we took it out of the collection. And to be quite frank, I'm not sure how that painting was was uh, disposed of. It was probably sold uh, at in some sort of an auction environment. That with the paintings that we de have deaccessioned in the past, generally just... speaking, that's considered the most professional way to dispose of an, a former art museum object is to sell it at public. Auction. It's just so strange that there's some person out there that collects strange old paintings that nobody wants and, in a museum. And really bad strange yeah, paintings. Exactly. Yeah, that's weird. We might have acquired this thing. Um, I don't, I'm not sure. But the, so, so this but sounds the like, bottom line is... Oh, sorry. Go. You know, well, the bottom line is we don't want the museum investing its resources, uh, storage space, wall space, all of that in art that doesn't meet quality level of other art in the collection itself. We want to take the resources that those things are are consuming and apply them to other works of art that we feel are worthy of being in the collection. Mm -hmm. um, I also imagine that the amount of scholarship that goes into deaccessioning something has to just be phenomenal, like the amount of just human hours that it sounds like right. it takes to do that. Is sure. There, there, there are forms that we fill out. Uh, the registrars, who are kind of uh -huh. our record keepers at the museum, and the people who are in charge of talking, uh, uh, monitoring the condition of the works of art and all of that at the museum, they do a tremendous amount of work in research, trying to track down how did we get it, where, when did we get it, what kind of uh, conditions does it have that are affecting its uh, ability to be conserved or preserved. All of those things, they, they document all of that. They look into, uh, was it given by a donor? So does the donor have ears? They do all of that work. Then it comes to me, and I have to lay out, why do I think that this work doesn't deserve to be in the collection anymore? Mm -hmm. And I will say, um, in our museum's case, 90% of everything that we have deaccessioned, at least while I've been there, um, has been for condition reasons, really. More oh, really? than for, we just don't like it anymore, it doesn't fit anymore. We haven't really deaccessioned anything, or, I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm probably overstating that. I, I would say 
because I can't remember absolutely everything that I've signed off on. There may be a few pieces that I've signed off on that I went, this just isn't good enough quality to be here anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but nine times, I would say, or eight times out of ten, let's say, it's a condition problem. And it's a condition okay. problem that existed before we got it. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, and so, so this sounds like one of those things that this is not an issue for more mature museums, but it sounds like something that happens kind of on the starting block of most museums. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Like, we didn't start out as an art museum. The um, the museum started out as a combination art and history museum. Mm -hmm. And most of the historical artifacts were were transferred to other institutions before I came back to work at the museum. But okay, when I was there, as an, when I was there as a high school student, they were they were there. Um, and, the, you know, it was like great aunt Susie gave her grandmother's christening gown. Oh. And the poor little, that poor little fabric muslin dress had, like, somebody had pinned with a straight pin a little piece of paper on it that said, this is great Aunt Susie, blah, 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 blah's grandmother's christening dress. We think it was made in 1832. Yeah, that does not I, sound like an object for you guys. Oh, no. Well, it, 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 and not only that, but the very fact that they had taken a straight pen and pinned a piece of paper to it, make, put holes in it, <laughs> and the, the acid from the paper basically oh, discolored the muslin. And, you know, it was, it, they didn't understand all that. Well, that's okay. So, yeah, and that's something that so most yeah. people just aren't going to understand. They, didn't, they did not know what they did when they did that. So, yeah, nowadays yeah. with the internet, you could just look up how to do that. Yes, you could. And, and all to the good. Yeah. And thank you, internet. Let's see what else. Yeah, it's deaccessioning. Um, now, uh, while we're talking about the, the condition of things and... and um, and uh, getting pieces into the collection and things like that. Uh, I assume for some pieces of art, nothing really has to be done with them when they come into the museum. Like the marble sculpture right. you were talking about, I imagine that there's no real mounting equipment that goes on that or anything like that. No, it, but it's if I give a work a of paper, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. If I give a work of paper, um, what goes into that? If I give a painting that has like this really big crazy gold frame on it, does it keep the crazy gold frame? Um, it kind of depends. Um, there's a lot of factors involved in that. Let's just talk about the painting with the crazy girl Frank. Okay. Yeah. Um, when was the painting made? Let's just say this painting was made in the 1840s. Okay. All right. So we we get this painting somehow. The museum. We either get it at auction or we get it from a donor or we somehow we get it, and it comes in. And it's got a crazy gold frame that you described. Mm -hmm. And the crazy gold frame, the name for that most likely that, that the thing you're thinking of when it would Chippendale style. Okay. Which is English 18th century, right? All right. Has nothing to do with a painting made in the 1840s. Not that a painting made in the 18th century not have had Chippendale frame on it because somebody had an old frame. But realistically, in the museum environment, we try to marry the style of the frame to the period of the painting, if we can. Okay. Not not always possible, but but we try. Because, so would those again, frames be be fabricated? Um, uh, like would would, well, would the famous would the frame essentially be faked to make it look correct? Um. Well, I you know ideally we would find a period eighteen forty frame. Oh wow. And put it on there. In other words, we'd actually and then we actually did this in one case where we bought a painting at auction. And uh, it was in a it, it was made in the 1830s, and we it was had it had an inappropriate uh, frame on it, uh, and we literally went to a frame dealer who <laughs> specializes in antique frames, and we found an appropriate frame that was made in the 1830s. It had to be adapted a little bit, but yeah. not that much, and we paid a lot of money to I put the imagine. right frame on it. So, but that, but that is not a, that doesn't happen all the time. But there are other instances where, for example, and this is another good example collection, we have a Thomas Hart Benton painting that we bought at auction mm -hmm. um, about four, four years ago or so. It has on it a frame 
that was literally put on it by the art, picked out and put on it by the artist's wife. Okay. Um, and that frame is original by the, it was put on it by the artist's wife when the painting was with the artist and his wife. We would never remove that painting out of that. Uh, okay. We would never change the frame for any reason. Yeah. Even if we didn't like it or we, whatever, okay, we would so. not change that because it's original to the, you know, it is, that is kind of the sacrosanct marriage. You don't divorce those, uh, Okay, I those see that. Pieces. Yeah, that would make, that makes good sense. So most pieces fall somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Um, we, we try to frame everything as appropriately as we can to the style and time period. But of course, we can't afford to do what we did with that first painting that I described all the time. Mm -hmm. We just don't have the funds to do that. Yeah, I assume that gets so used we try for to, special. So in, yeah, in some ways, a lot of times people will come into the museum and when you see a painting, uh, you're going to see a very generic frame on that painting. Okay. It, sh it shouldn't be distracting to you to look at the painting in that frame. If mm -hmm. it's distracting, then we have to do something about it. But yeah. realistically, if it's not distracting, we basically just leave a generic frame on it until we can afford to do something better or we need to. That's Where works on paper are concerned, that's, yeah, yeah. that's another completely different situation. Works on paper normally get remounted by us. Okay in acid-free material. So that just means pulled um, out of the frame and put on a new mat. Pulled out of the frame, pulled out of the mat. Yes, exactly. And then it, typically what would happen with that if we got some frame, it would be unframed, it would be taken out of the mat. The, the registrars would look at it and they would document its condition. You know, a lot of, is there foxing? Is there um, some sort of um, and, staining from acid? Uh, foxing uh, is, is something in the... Um, that's like a you know like a mold or a addition. Okay. Um, all of that kind of uh, kind of um, growth that can happen <laughs> yeah. in a closed environment where you've got to work inside of a frame and there's no air exchange and there's moisture and mm. you get a mold spore and all of a sudden you got you know all that. Okay. So it's all it's all pulled apart, assessed. Then if things are looking okay, you know, there's no active mold, there's like, it's fine enough. Then we remounted acid-free material. And depending upon the situation and the size, we may reframe it, but okay. more than likely we don't reframe it. We store it just oh. in a mat, in an acid-free box, in a, in a waterproof, uh, or water resistant at least, cabinet. Yeah sealed up in the dark <laughs> yep. with perfect environment. So it's living in a happy home. And then so so before yeah. that goes on the wall, it gets framed just like right before yes. it goes on the wall? Okay. Yes, correct. Temporarily framed. Oh. We have a we have a collection of frames that we uh, enter use uh, for different works of art because we try to frame everything. We try to mat everything to standard sizes that mat frames. Well, that makes so sense. we can switch them out. Yeah. So then we have the, a collection of all of the that. mats are custom, but then the frames don't have to be. Correct. Exactly. Well, they're, they're, again, we're talking about a generic set of frames. Yes. And yes. we have a lot of old master. So we have a lot of frames that are consistent framing old master prints, like yeah. gold frames and gold flames. And that's what's up. Or um, black frames with a little gold. That You know, that kind of What's thing up in the show that's up right together. now? Is it black frames? I think it's black frames. In wheel print room? No, in the um, temporary, the the further temporary space. Who is up right now? Why am I doing name name blank? Is it Rembrandt? No. Yeah. Oh, the Rembrandt now. Yeah. Oh yeah yeah yeah. We yeah that that was, um, I think it's come down. But yes, that was a collection of frames that we owned, that are yeah black and gold, and so we kind of you know mixed and matched to put together the framed collection. But yeah, that that's typically what happens, and there are certain situations. Um, a lot of people are familiar with the fact that we have a really wonderful collection of drawings by Bill Trailer, mm -hmm. important um, 20th century self-taught artist who was from Montgomery, mm -hmm. um, very well respected now and, uh, and collected in a number of institutions. We have a collection of about 30 of his pieces. They're unique because they were made fragile. Uh, acidic material like oh. cardboard basically oh great um, yeah. so so caring for those is a real uh, challenge in terms of making sure that we keep the um, environment for those 
uh, clean, mm-hmm. and and we don't allow them the acidity from the the uh, mount or uh, sorry the um, the paper the the cardboard that they're painted on. We don't we have to make sure that we are monitoring the condition of those over time, and they will have to be re added um, periodically in okay. order to take out material that they're that is absorbing the acidity from the cardboard. Oh, that's interesting. They'll have to peri- they'll have to be periodically remounted. We haven't had to do that. we we got a grant um, to to have a conservator actually mount those for us. Oh, so eventually great. they'll have to be remounted. Yeah. That's really cool. But but that's a, a again that's kind of a unique situation. Yeah. Um, and now in a in in an instance like this where there's nobody at the museum, does all the work get squirreled away back to a safer space or does it stay up? Is that the safest place for it to be? Well, you know, um, not yeah, most And this is a little inside that, baseball, so if it's it's not an okay question, that's totally okay. No, 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 no. It, no, it's fine. Um we're we're kind of doing a balancing act. All of our permanent collection stays up. Okay. Because essentially, it's as safe as it would be in a storage area. Okay. Uh, especially with nobody there. Um, but the works on paper, we're being attentive to taking those down and putting those away. Okay. Uh, because there's n- no one there, yeah. um, and they don't need to be out. Um, so the Rembrandt, we we were just talking, the yeah. Rembrandt has come down and and is going back into storage because unfortunately, sadly, we won't be reopening before that show was due to close. Mm-hmm. So yeah, but not everything needs to go away. And and to be honest, we we do have storage for most of it, but it's it's just as well off where it is in the galleries when we close. Well, it's it's just a, such an odd situation where there's now weeks where nobody will be in the museum. Well, and you know that's a it's interesting if you've been paying attention to the news. There's been a, a kind of an emphasis in certain places on how. Um, good for the environment it is that everybody's staying home yep. uh, there's lower pollution levels you know there's uh, birds are coming back and like nesting in places where they didn't nest before yep. because they're not being disturbed all, all the, the time. waters of little venice of are ha- clear little bits yeah little bits of habitat being being kind of reclaimed well in the museum sense you know with all the lights kind of off and down Mm-hmm. It's kind of nice for our environment in there. You know, it's reducing the amount of exposure that all of our art has to to light over time. And that's not a bad thing. Well, I imagine the humidity is much better in there, too, without human beings. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And without the light fluctuating yep. on and off. Although we, we have done a significant exchange to LED, so that's actually helped. That oh, that really helps, yeah. 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 So. Uh, let's see. Um so one thing you, you we were talking about way 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 long ago um that uh one of the things that you do is not just grab you know 10 pieces that you think look good together and put them up on a wall but mm-hmm. it's why those pieces are together up for this show uh can you talk a little bit more about that um just like yeah. by what metrics you put stuff together and also then how do you write about that for other academics one and then how do you yeah. write about that for normal folks like us walking through the museum and just trying to look at pretty pictures and get something from it yeah you know that that's all a portion of fulfilling the role of the museum as an institution mm-hmm. which it, I gets attention but probably doesn't get as much attention as it might <clears throat> the whole educational aspect mm-hmm but when you talk about when you ask okay well so how do you decide what to what kind of work to put together to create an exhibition and i would say there's so many different um, metrics that you can use to kind of measure what would make sense in terms of an exhibition um i i go through a lot of you know things will come to me uh just in the shower right you know (laughs) oh i should do a show that is uh, i can i vaguely remember and i think this i can remember being in the shower and going you know that song that they that's so stupid who let the dogs out yeah and i'm i'm i think that must have been playing or i must have heard it or something 
and I was and I thought, oh, I should put together a, a collection of images of dogs at the in prints at the museum. Okay, so and that's I fun for the, us. How do you justify that in an academic sense? A, absolutely. Why? <laughs> you know, why would you do that? Yeah. Well, basically, I, the idea was I took images that featured dogs from all different kinds of um, periods of time mm -hmm. and different media, and kind of analyzed the way form that did was it the form of the dog that played a function in the work of art, mm -hmm. or was it the idea of the dog? Was it like the man's understanding of the quality of the dog? Oh, that's you know, interesting. Like the role and, of, of yeah. yeah, all the kind of the iconography of the dog and art over time, and how it was different, and sometimes and other times. And I actually managed to find examples of things that kind of set those those ways of seeing dogs apart. And that was sort of part of the content of that show. Yeah. Um, so it. It was interesting, and the writing the labels. You asked about that, mm -hmm. how you how you convey the educational part of it. I tend to be the person who writes better in a in an academic way, just uh -huh. because that's my experience. But we have recently gotten a group of uh, folks together at the museum who are in our education department and in our department, editorial department, um, to talk about different ways that we can approach um, incorporating uh, educational components in our galleries. And we're trying to do more of that kind of as a team and group. Um, and one of the con uh, concepts of that, one of the elements of that is writing better label. Okay. So I, te I tend to write, I t as you may have noticed yeah, since I've... we've talked for nearly two hours, I tend to talk <laughs> a lot. <laughs> And I can write a lot, too. When I've read um, some of your unedited labels, which are uh, wordy, to say the least. Yeah. Lengthy, they <laughs> are. Because, you know, I just want to love it. Uh, but you can't do that in a label. And nope. we all recognize that. So we're working on trying to be better about how we uh, package the information that we're putting out there to make it more accessible to people in the galleries and and on too mm -hmm. um, to try to be a little bit better about that but that's but again that's something that comes from embracing doing a better job of embracing as an educational institution yeah um, so I'm, I'm part of that but I'm really only a part of it in some ways I'm really the provider of the content and I'm hoping and working with other people to make that more accessible in a way that doesn't come naturally to me. So you're allowing uh, so. some other people to do some translation work in the middle, it sounds like. Yeah, okay. absolutely. And, and and trying to kind of be a little bit patient with that because, you know, anybody like who writes these kinds of things thinks it's all important for yep. them to know. Every word is Every word, <laughs> every is, special. word is important. It's all key. It's a... You've got to have it. Well, no, you yeah, really yes. don't. <laughs> Sometimes and you think we, And I go back and I read things that are edited. It's like, oh, yeah, okay, well, no, I didn't need all that. Yeah, it's all good. Yes, yeah, so, so. so you spoke a little bit about um, working with other departments on, on getting all that stuff together. Um, what are the other departments that you work with? And are there any in other museums that don't exist in the museum here? Do you guys have anything special here that isn't in most museums? Um, uh, well, who, what are those I'd other say there groups. What are those other entities? Yeah, well, uh, a number. I mean, when, when if you're involved as an employee at a much larger museum, there are many more specialized resources. Division of labor is mm -hmm. much more uh, uh, common at a larger museum. For example, in Montgomery, we have registrars and we have preparators. The preparators are the people who put the art on the walls for us mm -hmm. and do the framing and the matting and the actual. And in Montgomery, the, our preparators are, are kind of intimately involved with the design of the exhibitions, where okay. things go, how they're installed, what they look like on the wall. At yeah. other museums, there are whole exhibition design departments. And okay. they are people like you that have, you know, knowledge, design, and graphic uh, art, and and a real, you know, sensitivity to 
materials and what kinds of materials can be used to create different kinds of installations and all of that knowledge is is very valuable and in, if you go to a, and you walk into a space and you just are bowled over the, by the beauty of what you see a lot of that has to do with the art of course but it also has to do with the exhibition designers yeah and connected to the exhibition design people are the people that in other museums that are specific in education departments that don't do anything but edit educational materials that are designed for the public on the walls. Like okay. there, at, and there are education departments where there are label, uh, well, for lack of a better term, I call them the label police. Uh, I worked with the a label very good police. One, Is that what you said? The label police. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. well, I worked with a really good one from over at the High Museum. The High Museum in Atlanta. They we were working on a show together on a trailer show, together. and I had written label copy, and my co-curator from the High label copy. And both of our label copies got submitted to the label police. And the other curator and I were sitting one afternoon kind of going over all the edits. And we were both just kind of shaking our heads and like we were drinking a glass of wine because we had to keep calm. Yeah, of <laughs> because course. all of us were used to like, like just, we were just like so upset because they were so uh, truncated, yeah. for lack of a better word. But we had to admit they did the job, you know. And yep. realistically, when you're walking down, if you step back from your role as a curator and go in as a visitor, mm -hmm. you appreciate going up to a painting and being able to spend your time looking at the painting and, and not, not having to read reading the a panel. label yeah. that is three paragraphs long, right? Yeah, that's fair. I guess it's uh, yeah. whichever. So there's a role for label. <laughs> there's a role um, for label, please. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Um, and then the, uh, in many museums, uh, many larger museums, there are whole conservation departments. There are literally conserva conservation people on staff whose job it is to do the kind of make the preservation decisions and do treatments and uh, all of that sort of mm -hmm. thing. We, again, rely on service for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Fortunately, we're, you know, we're in a position where a lot of what we have acquired uh, at the museum is in good physical condition well, to begin great, with yeah. when we acquire it. So we don't need a whole lot of conservation service, but when we do, we're, we're able to contract for that. Yeah, that's really great. Um, what, going back to what writing the, the, uh, the label police, uh, and, <laughs> and that sort of, and that sort of thing. Um, have you found that, that that's getting easier or harder over time? Or is there just a different audience that you're writing to now that you weren't before? Yeah. Um, what's, yeah. what's the difference over time? Because you've been, you've been doing this a lot longer than most yeah. of the people listening to this have been alive yeah. or reading yes. at least, definitely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, philo I think philosophical change um, professionally in art museums actually uh, to, to try to balance out that sense that uh, art in museums are elitist institutions. Mm -hmm. Like they're for wealthy people. They're, they're for rich white men, basically, yeah. and white women. Um, they're, the direction of installation uh, for m most every professional museum now, especially in the United States, is to try to make the materials that we collect accessible to a much broader public than was originally uh, anticipated. You know, yeah. I'm not going to say it was intended. I don't think that it was evil. I think yeah. it's just the way society yeah. was that there were people who, quote unquote, belonged in versus people who were the public who would just wander in and be allowed to look. Yes. And did yeah. we care what they thought? No, not really. Did we want to educate them? Well, if they want to be educated, then yeah. if they don't, they don't have to. You know, all that kind of attitude just was kind of fed for a number of different uh, reasons for a number of different years. But, you know, our society, I think, has made a, a significant shift toward we do want the public, everybody in our society, to understand why we collect what we collect. 
it's important for the protection of the objects that people in society value it and want to that they want to support it that they want the yeah, that makes they want their public sense. they want their public funds to go to protecting this work and they want to give their private funds in order to facilitate that they want to practice philanthropy in order to make sure this art survives in order to justify all that we've got to be responsive to what it is they want to learn it and how they can access it. Well, yeah, and it's so, so interesting it's a, um, that just knowing about something goes so far for uh, appreciating it and, and caring about it. If you don't know it exists, you can't, can't care about it. Correct. Exactly. And, and realistically for us in a place like Montgomery, Alabama, um, we, we have a, a higher mountain to climb. I'd be just yeah. very frank about it because our institution uh, edu- our public education system here in our city is is not very good yeah. about uh, focusing on anything related to art or culture, and so uh, you know we're we're trying to go out there and connect with people as best we can. When a lot of times they just may not have the funding uh, that people in, in other uh, locales may have, or that people in history have. They just don't have that much information to call upon. So sometimes we have to tailor our approach to what is accessible. So that's what we do. Well, that's just fantastic. Let me see if I have anything else um, on this list. Oh, that's actually, this is kind of a complete uh, tangent, but a note that I had from er from earlier. Um, You're talking about outsider artists in museums Mm -hmm. and things like... um, like quilts being in museums um yes and and for things that don't have a bunch of people agreed all of a sudden that it had value how do these things get there how do you get to a point where we all of a sudden decided as a as an artistic society that quilts have value (laughs) well do you want the aspirational answer or do you want the answer that, like okay let's get real about it let, let, let's like, do aspirational let's, first and then reality do aspirational after. first yeah. okay aspirationally i would say there there is a an a, a, a much greater appreciation now i think and this is this is a little bit my opinion um there's a much greater appreciation now for the the genuine handmade came out of the soul of the individual because they just felt compelled to express Uh type approach to art Uh as opposed to the uh into the more intellectual like this is important because intellectually it has this grounding yeah I, be- I honestly believe that heartfelt expression plays a role in people's wanting to get to know creations by artists that were not necessarily trained as artists. Not that they aren't artists, they, they were, in, but they weren't trained. Yeah, of course. But, and their, their, their products have that sense of, of what we used to call in the South, genuine <laughs> art. It's genuine. <laughs> it, and that is a an element that is not often seen in a lot of modern and contemporary art. There is a suspicion that, you know, a box by John L. Judd is just a freaking box. Yeah. You know, why is that important? Why is this wooden box? What is this box about? There's a lot, there's just a hard to access that. You've got to know a lot of art, art history. You got to know about Donald Judd. You got to know exceptionalism. Got to know about, got to know all that stuff. Right, yep. you gotta you gotta have a context for it. You gotta have the vocabulary. You don't have it; it's just a box. Yes. That's and when you true. walk up and you look at a quilt, you don't need any context for a quilt. You can look at a piece of fabric that has beautiful color, that has um, an intricate pattern of quilting, that you know that the person who did this was sitting, engaged in an activity that they were, that that came from their dedication. To making something for their family, for themselves. So there's an appreciation for that, I think, and I and I, I suspect that's... that a lot of what we can 
connect to as an appreciation for self-taught has to do with that and much more. I mean, it's a lot more complicated than I've just made it sound, but I do think that there is that element. You know, okay. but if, when we, we want to, if we want to get to the, the element that's a little more mer, mer, um, mercenary, yeah. there is that element there. Um, a lot of other art is so expensive, so uh. already in museum. So there, there, there's not that much there historically anymore mm -hmm. to be able to access uh, for dealers and for the market. Mm -hmm. So creating a new market yes. creates income yep. and, and value for people who are engaged in the art business. That's, yeah. that's the more that that's the mercenary take on it, but and there undoubtedly there is a, some of that there too. Um, I'd like to hope that it's a minor element, and not the major one. And I do think that to a certain extent, both of those things are in play when you talk about the oh, rise yeah. of interest in contemporary uh, self-taught art, for sure. Yeah, that's great. Um, and as that that sort of art comes in, as things like quilts come in, does that change uh, all the stuff we were talking about earlier about conservation and keeping it and showing it? And I imagine it's much different to show a quilt than it is to show a painting or a, or a work on paper in a frame. It well, it's it's much closer to a work on paper. Because, oh really? Okay. Uh, because textiles are basic. We you know basically paper is a, is a form textile, of textile. It's, yeah. it's 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 you know it's basically uh, the little fibers. Uh, same thing, it, you know, with the the dyes that are used in these fabrics um, are fugitive, very subject to light damage over time, mm -hmm. just like a carpet would be or your sofa. Uh, so yeah, we have we have very strict um, guidelines for how long and where, how we uh, can show quilts, uh, in the same way we would work on paper for sure. Interesting. Um... We're getting towards end of time here. Uh, we've definitely filled the time. Uh, I'm pretty much done with all the, the real important questions that I had. Is there anything that you want to share with um, gen ed art students uh, or, or with whoever's going to uh, listen to this afterwards? <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess the only thing I would say is, it, you know, it's interesting to be able... To, for me to be able to step back and kind of, I've enjoyed having the conversation because mm -hmm. it's interesting for me to step back and think in a linear way about what I do and why I do it and how I do it. And, um, and I would, you know, I would say, I think working, if I'm going to put a plug for working in museums, which sure. I probably yeah. should or do. Or even going because, to museums you know, or whatever. We need... Well, certainly for going to museums, for sure. Oh, well, yeah, that for definite, sure. But also, you know, the the profession needs people to come into the profession um, who are passionate about art. Yeah. And who understand its value, both to themselves and to the human race uh -huh. and to society and um, the, the thing that I think about, I guess, as a curator now, uh, having been a curator for such a long time, is the impact of the digital sharing of information uh -huh. and imagery. And I, you know, putting that in the context of what does that do to the need for people to actually go and be with an object in a gallery? Uh -huh. Like, do we even need that in? Why do we even pull things out of storage and put them on a wall when we can, you know, we can basically make a high definition image of it and uh, photograph it and all of these. Yeah. Good, um, well, I could tell you from the perspective of teaching that uh, seeing the thing in real life definitely beats a projector any day of the week. I think Margaret Lynn's microphone is dying. I don't think I could have planned this if I wanted to. I'm going to pause the recording real quick and we'll get back to it when she gets back. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, we're starting recording again. All right, go. Okay, all right. So what I would say is that uh, the, the profession, art museum profession, 
needs people who are passionate about art, who understand its importance to themselves, their society, our culture, um, and also understand it within the context of what is now our new reality, which is digital society. I mean, mm-hmm. we're having this talk in this medium in this way because you and I actually can't sit in the same room and have a talk with each other Correct. Uh, in the way that we might have before, where we would record when we were in the same space. Um, but having people who understand the importance of the object itself being accessible to people so that there is a place where people can go and feel a connection with the art of the past that is tangible yeah. rather than just a re- reproduce. Um, that to me is kind of an important thing to think about for the future of our our society and, and really people who are going to come after us, even after you and after student. Um, it's going to come a world that's going to be incredibly different than the one we know now. But I would like to hope that there's always going to be a role for these objects in the lives of people and that maybe, possibly, they begin to take on even more importance over time yeah. because they do. They are a physical connection with our past. Yeah. Um, and then while we're on the topic of the digital, this will be the last question uh, just because I uh, kind of had it in here as a curveball for you. Um, <laughs> of course you as can. a curator, uh, especially a curator who's been doing this for quite some time, the whole concept of memes, right? You have this hugely mutable thing, whether you consider it art or not. It's a mutable yes. output of visual content. Um, it is, yes. How would you as a curator collect that? Or is it even mm. possible? Um, well, it seems like it should be possible. It seems like it's these days it's possible to connect, collect almost anything. Um, you know, you can collect video, you can collect uh, digital files of sound. You know, there's, there's all kinds of ways to, to document and collect. It's not so much just collecting it to me as it is kind of um, determining what to collect. Well, yeah, like that's what I, that, that, I, I should have said that, yeah. yeah How do you curate that collection? It, because it's so pervasive and there's so much uh, I would think you would have to just assemble a huge collection. Like, and I was, I'm thinking in terms of a database. Just make, mm-hmm. collect everything that you see, or you know, that you see that you think is interesting as a, a curator, and assemble all of it, and then get to know it, live with it, and see which things start seeming more important than others. Is that? Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, yeah, that makes there sense. There seems to there just seems to be some relationship amongst Expose things. yourself to and, it repeatedly until something yeah, rises to the starts, top. Okay. Yeah, it's, it, it's still thing, things things then kind of start to string together. Like, oh, I see this consistently here, or I see this factor, or I see this imagery, or I see this focus on dealing with this idea or concept. And it just takes time. I, I tell people it's, um, I don't deal with, I try not to deal with contemporary art. I don't say I don't, I, don't, I try not. Really, it takes about 10 years to have historical context for something. Okay. So anything over 10 years, I think, okay, well, we can set up a context for this. Same thing for memes, you know. Yeah, yeah about, 10 about 10 years. years then okay. you'll know what's important. So the memes <laughs> from 2010 are okay to start looking at. Yep. Okay. Go for it. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for joining me. Um, You're welcome that was... very much. I'm sorry. We had a couple of difficult Oh, no, um, that's, glitches, that's totally but... fine. I expected there would be at least something. Um, yeah. And out of all the problems, the, those were not the worst. And they were definitely weird and interesting. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, have a lovely day. Uh, thank you for being my very inaugural uh, interviewee. And, uh, yeah, I, talk to you later, Margaret. I, I, I definitely enjoyed it. Take care, Wyndham. I will.